I got new posters. When a show is as consistently spectacular as The Owl House, episodes like Witches Before Wizards tend to get lost in the shuffle. IMDb currently ranks it 38th out of 40 total episodes, and after season 3 airs, I expect it'll rank 41st out of 43. Witches Before Wizards essentially acts as a second pilot for the series, as well as a metatextual deconstruction of Chosen One narratives that tend to dominate pop culture like Harry Potter, Star Wars, and my personal favorite of this subgenre. I'm Buffy. The vampire slayer and you are? Luce grew up reading similar stories like The Good Witch Azura, so when she stumbles across the Boiling Isles, her first impulse is to believe in predeterminism because she assumes that life and fiction operate under similar pretenses. Why am I here? What if I, Luce Noceda, average teen, actually had a predetermined path of greatness? This desire for purpose is quickly exploited by Adagast, the puppeteer demon who sends her on a fake quest in order to lure Ida into a trap. I find this conflict interesting because in the previous episode, Luce makes the choice to stay in a fantasy world instead of returning to reality. In this episode, she faces the inverted choice. She picks reality over Adagast's fantasy. It is beautiful here, and you guys think I'm special. But it's not real! After such a discouraging encounter, Ida gives Luce some of the best advice I've ever heard. Look kid, everyone wants to believe they're chosen. But if we all waited around for a prophecy to make us special, we'd die waiting. And that's why you need to choose yourself. Ida's advice falls along the spectrum of existentialism, which is essentially the philosophical opposite of predeterminism. Whereas existentialism emphasizes the importance of an individual's free will, predeterminism argues that there isn't such a thing as free will, because every event in the past, present, and future has already been decided for us. Existentialism argues that we are defined by our choices, and the notion that everything happens for a reason kind of invalidates any and all of the choices we make. Meaning is a thing we construct brick by brick, but if we refuse to make choices, then we become objects in the universe at the mercy of its circumstances, and most members of the Owl House's ensemble cast fit into this category before they meet loose. In a broad sense, every inhabitant of the Boiling Isles has surrendered their free will to Emperor Bellos and his coven system. They aren't allowed to practice magic as they'd please. Only a select few can learn about different types of magic that have made no sense. In an individualistic sense, each one of Luce's friends has an unhealthy attachment to a preconceived notion about themselves. To these passive characters, identity is merely something that someone else ascribed to them. This is why people call you half a witch willow. I got the new prodigy to do it for me. I'm a blight. We only associate with a select few. You know, I'm the youngest scout to become Golden Guard. Who dares intrude upon I, the King of Demons! Once these characters meet Luce, they begin to edit their own self-perceptions because she inspires them to make more meaningful choices. Willow! Wow, you're so unnoticeable I almost rolled into ya! Willow starts the series with little to no confidence, and what's interesting about her lack of self-worth is that it was imposed upon her. But Willow was a late bloomer. Late bloomers are only considered thus because standardized education punishes children who fall outside of the predetermined norms. Willow is tremendously powerful, but her talents aren't given a platform to shine because she's not in the proper school track. Her parents want her to study abominations because that field of study offers better opportunities down the line, but she has no aptitude for this type of magic, so she's essentially trapped in a cycle of failure. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't stay. I have to go disappoint my teacher. Luce immediately befriends her and offers to pose as her homework assignment, and these shenanigans lead to Willow joining the plant magic track at the behest of a deeply impressed Principal Bump. This is Willow's first step towards self-actualization, but she still suffers from intense insecurities because she's under the impression that Amity stopped being her friend because of her magical ineptitude. You're a weakling! You can't do magic, so I don't want to be your friend! Now go! In actuality, Amity never thought this. Her parents did. Well, she's my best friend. Nonsense. Blights only associate with the strongest of witchlings. This is a lasting scar on Willow's psyche, one that's agitated every time Basha bullies her. Luce stands up for her best friend at every turn, which eventually inspires Willow to put her foot down and make the definitive choice to defend herself. Now let's finish this. My way. Willow unfortunately doesn't get many opportunities to shine in season two. The one Willow-centric episode we do get isn't really about Willow. It's about Hunter but there are still interesting aspects of her character on display. Willow's confidence has been steadily growing, but deep down, she still feels inadequate, like she'll always be half a witch. I'm just half a witch Willow. The Abomination Teacher is unwilling to greenlight her club because he views her as a quitter, 
when in actuality, she just wasn't well suited for his curriculum. This makes Willow's choice to assemble a team of other underestimated students all the more fitting. Now I'm only scarred emotionally. I would cosplay Viney in a heartbeat if I ever actually left the house. Willow's only other subplot in season two is relearning how to be friends with Amity, which is something I deeply appreciate. Willow, you were never too weak to be my friend. I was too weak to be yours. <laughs> Amity's initial apology doesn't fix everything. The two of them still have years worth of baggage and pain to process, and by the time Luce helps them reconnect, they've grown into very different people. They still care about each other, but they have to relearn how to demonstrate that. I don't want your protection! I want you to see who I really am! Writing this script has helped me develop a whole new appreciation for Willow's character. Forgive the pun, but we get to watch her bloom right before our very eyes, and I think that's pretty awesome. You've done it again, Augustus. Gus is a burnt-out, gifted kid waiting to happen. Hence why I love him. His talents were evident from a very young age, which resulted in him skipping several grades in school. This move resulted in two major consequences. Consequence number one. Gus struggles with making friends because people want to use his innate abilities for their own gain. And all I had to do was pretend to be his friend. <gasps> Consequence number two. Gus lives under constant, self-imposed pressure to live up to his status as a prodigy, and this pressure causes him to develop a crippling fear of making mistakes. I let myself get tricked. Again. Mistakes aren't a reflection of our self-worth. They are merely choices that didn't pan out as intended. But manipulative and abusive people will make you think otherwise. More on that when I get to Hunter's section of the video. It's almost like gifted kids are taught that mistakes are a luxury we aren't allowed to make. Which is painfully ironic, because mistakes provide the best learning opportunities. Finally, I'm gonna become my best self! You're always your best self. <laughs> Gus's fear of mistakes is fully fleshed out in Season 2, but the way it presents itself in earlier episodes is kind of brilliant. I'd argue that in Season 1, Gus's defining trait is his hyperfixation with humans. He's the president of the Human Appreciation Society, owning a human bucket is on his bucket list, and when he meets Luce, he immediately adopts a human nickname. I'd known Augustus back in the human world. We called him Gus. Gus? Nickname? Human nickname? He is a self-proclaimed human expert, and the word expert should be considered noteworthy here because people on the Boiling Isles know very little about humans, so there's no one to challenge his expertise. Gus's hyperfixation with humans isn't really about humans. It's about being right and knowledgeable about something that no one can correct him on. It's a field of study where he can't easily make a mistake. Being younger than everyone is hard. You're overlooked, ignored. But at the HAS, I matter. Genuine self-worth can't come from external sources. And if you didn't experience the luxury of learning this lesson at a young age, you might look a little bit like season two Lilith. <laughs> Watching the ink dry is the best part. Ah. Gus eventually grows out of this mindset because he develops friendships with people who value his personhood above all else. You're always worthy of love, regardless of what your talents are. Cause that would be absurd behavior for little Miss Perfect! Oh god, where do I even start with Amity? Amity identifies with, like, ten different monikers because she grew up believing that she had to justify her own existence with a constant stream of achievements and accolades, hence why she clings to the title of top student when we first meet her. It's like mine, but much smaller and meaningless. I miss Feral Amity. By no means was she happy or fulfilled, but she sure was a ton of fun. Amity is the character who is arguably furthest away from her authentic self at the start of the series because her parents have curated every aspect of her identity. They've handpicked her friends, they've chosen her future coven, and her mother dyes Amity's naturally brown hair green because she wants her three children to look like a matching set. A blight always upholds their end of the deal. I love the irony of Amity's last name. The Blights are a well-respected family on the Boiling Isles, but the word Blight has two definitions, both of which are connotatively bad. The first is a plant disease, which alludes to Amity's broken friendship with Willow, and the second is a thing that spoils or damages something. Being a Blight is both literally and metaphorically damaging to Amity. No matter how hard she tries, she can never live up to the image her parents have of her because that image is distorted and incomplete. 
We as individuals are reflected in the people around us. So the road to authenticity starts when we surround ourselves with people who embody the qualities we truly value. Who are you? I want answers! Amity Blight! Huh? The fact that this is their first interaction will never not be funny to me. Amity initially seems like your standard cartoon bully character, the Pacifica Northwest to Luce's Mabel Pines. But the writers quickly show us Amity's hidden depths. You think it's so easy to be a witch. I have been working my whole life to get to the top. You lost. You cheated. Say it. Say you're not a witch. Amity's problem with Luce is that Luce challenges all of Amity's preconceived notions about her life. A human who wants to be a witch would naturally appear threatening to a girl who's had to grind for every accomplishment. And since her sense of identity is tied to those accomplishments, she doesn't want them to be invalidated or devalued. Humans have no magical ability, but I doubt that'll stop you. Amity's only alcove for authenticity is the library, and it's here where Luce gets her first glimpse at the real Amity. Looks like this sour lemon drop has a hidden sweet center. Amity keeps her softer side locked away, which isn't exactly a rare character trait. Most people protect their authentic selves with a lock and key. It's a preservation instinct. We don't want to get hurt. The problem is that people misinterpret this lock and key metaphor as it pertains to love. The Pont des Arts is an infamous Parisian pedestrian bridge where tourists attached thousands of padlocks to the bridge's sides from 2008 to 2015. Couples thought that throwing the keys into the river below was a romantic gesture that represented their commitment and devotion to one another. According to existentialist philosophy, nothing could be further from the truth. Sky C. Cleary's 2018 article, Advice on Love from Nietzsche and Sartre, gives a great explanation for this thought process. A free individual shouldn't lock him or herself down in a relationship that may grow to be an uncomfortable cage. Throw away the key, and you throw away your freedom. To be free is to have the possibility to change course, redefine yourself, and overturn others' images of what you should be. Love is not a lock. Locks are rigid, cold, and inflexible. Love is the key that opens us up to a world of new possibilities. Luce's unrelenting affection and belief in Amity is what allows her to unfurl and make real choices for the first time in her life. Luce, Willow, and Gus are my friends! They're nice to each other! They listen to each other! They make me think about the kind of person I really want to be! One of the most interesting choices she makes is dyeing her hair purple. The in-universe explanation is that purple is a color associated with abomination magic, which is a detail her emotionally distant but ultimately well-intentioned father picks up on. I like your new hair color. It's abomination colors. Finally, someone gets it. Amity's hair is actually a shade of lavender, which is something I find particularly interesting because lavender is a color that has been associated with the LGBTQ community since the early 20th century. A lesser-known aspect of Joseph McCarthy's Red Scare is the Lavender Scare, which was the normalization of persecuting homosexuals through the bureaucratic institutionalization of homophobia. In 1969, Betty Friedan coined the phrase Lavender Menace to describe the threat she believed associating with lesbians posed to the women's rights movement. And a lavender marriage was a marriage between a man and a woman in which one or both parties were assumed to be gay. The term has since experienced a positive reclamation of identity, one that Amity both relates and contributes to. Her lavender hair is fitting because Luce and Amity's relationship is one of the most beautiful and earnest pieces of LGBTQ representation ever put to screen. Don't worry, you always have a way of sneaking into people's hearts. Y'all, I could gush about these two for hours. They're so freaking cute! In many ways, Eclipse Lake is the culmination of Amity's primary character arc. Luce falls ill with a common mold, and since they just started dating, Amity feels the need to prove her worth and earn the title of awesome girlfriend. She still believes that love is transactional because that's the toxic definition her parents ingrained in her head. But Luce showers Amity with affection freely and often because love is selfless and undiscerning. I grew up thinking that everything was an opportunity to justify existing. But there are people out there who won't make you feel worthless. You just have to let yourself meet them. Years of psychological abuse won't vanish overnight. It takes time to retrain your brain and form healthier connections. Love doesn't solve everything, but it certainly helps with the healing process. My name is Hunter. Ah yes, everyone's favorite bad but sad boy. Hunter is officially introduced in Season 2, which simultaneously makes analyzing him easy and extensive because this kid gets a significant portion of screen time. Hunter's mask hides his face during his first two appearances, which contributes to his air of confidence and self-importance. He takes great pride in his status, and why shouldn't he? 
He's the youngest scout ever to earn the position of Golden Guard. He's the Emperor's right-hand man, which means he experiences the brunt of his uncle's abuse. Please, be careful. Our family is gone because of wild magic. I can't let the same happen to you. Bellos doesn't love Hunter. He wants to control him. And he does so by limiting Hunter's exposure to the real world and gaslighting him at every turn. Manipulative and abusive people craft scenarios where their victims can't make meaningful choices. If Hunter makes a mistake, then it's a weapon Bellos can wield against him. And if Hunter completes a task, then he's merely done the bare minimum Bellos expects from him. Hunter can never make the correct choice because nothing will ever satisfy his uncle. I know you can do better, Hunter. Loose Willow, Amity, and Gus take turns trying to befriend Hunter like it's the world's funniest group project, but Hunter doesn't accept the helping hands extended to him because Bellos has warped Hunter's view of reality. He's under the impression that wild magic wiped out the rest of his family, and he thinks that he's in his uncle's debt because Bellos took him in and taught him artificial magic. It takes an accidental trip into Bellos' mind for Hunter to finally see what kind of person he's truly following. What a shame. Out of all the Grimwalkers, you look the most like him. What? Wow. Who could have guessed that Hunter was a clone? I did. Almost immediately. Still a cool scene, though. Hunter has a bit of an existential crisis after this reveal, which is to be expected because existential crises pertain to the reactionary despair someone experiences after they lose a defining aspect of their identity. Fiction! Fiction! Is our world but fiction? Then what in my life is real anymore? <laughs> Wikipedia's example of this phenomenon is a singer who loses their ability to sing. In Hunter's case, it's learning that his uncle keeps cloning him in hopes that he'll get a version of his brother that follows his every command. But every version of Caleb betrays Bellos, so Bellos always kills him and makes a new version, perpetuating their brotherly feud across the centuries in an unending cycle of abuse and torment. Give me just half a second. <laughs> what the fuck? Every aspect of Hunter's identity is cut from someone else's cloth. As wholesome as his bond with Flapjack is, Flapjack originally belonged to Caleb, which only makes it harder to differentiate the two. Then there's Darius, who is the mentee of one of the previous Grimwalkers. He only thinks Hunter is worthy of the title Golden Guard after he sees Hunter display qualities that his predecessor possessed. That's not to say that Flapjack and Darius don't care about Hunter, but their connections to other versions of him are worth noting because it begs the question, where does Caleb end and Hunter begin? I don't know. What we do know about Hunter is how he relates to each of Luce's friends. He has an inadequacy complex like Willow, he suffers from anxiety and self-imposed pressure like Gus, and he thinks he needs to prove his worth in order to receive love like Amity. Whereas those three have undergone major character transformations, Hunter is still growing because he's only recently broken free from his uncle's torment. If that's the case, have you told them about helping Philip? In this scene, he wields Luce's mistake like a weapon because he doesn't know any better. If anything, Luce helping Philip is the most in-character thing she's ever done because she wants to see the best in everybody. Her unyielding support encourages people to self-actualize, and Hunter is no exception to this phenomenon. The King of Demons yields to no one! King is my favorite character in the entire show, thanks in no small part to the fact that he reminds me of my dog. I am not your cutie pie! Yes, you are. <sighs> I know. His character arc is exceptionally engaging, which is impressive because he's only eight years old at the start of the series. King conflates his name with his identity, and the melding of these two concepts happened when he was very, very young. A king amongst his subjects. King. King! <laughs> when we first meet King, he is a lonely child whose visions of grandeur are not unlike Luce's. I was once the mighty king of demons! I was beloved almost as much as I was feared! But one dark day, an evil spell was cast, transforming me into this. Predeterminism dominates the philosophy behind monarchies. People used to believe that rulers were hand-picked by God himself. So it makes sense that a kid would find this kind of narrative appealing. King wants people to pay attention to him, and he doesn't care if that attention is negative. Aside from Ida, Luce is the first person to give King positive attention, and the ramifications of that attention cannot be understated because it helps him grow up. He learns how to put someone else's needs before his own. He sets his jealousy aside when he sees the resulting collateral damage. He makes new friends who love and care about him. And that's just in season one. In season two, King discovers the truth about his mysterious history. He isn't a deposed monarch. 
He's the last surviving Titan, and this realization shakes him to his core and forces him to confront what he truly wants out of life. I don't want people to see me as a big, scary monster anymore. We've all experienced that phase where we have to try and make sense of the world around us and ultimately redefine what our place in it is. As hard as that period of time can be, at least you didn't have to do it atop the decaying corpse of your long-dead relative. Um, hi. Neither King nor the audience understand what being a titan entails, but he does know what being part of a family is like. He may never know his blood relatives, but he has chosen Luce as his sister and Ida as his mother. And in their greatest moment of need, King makes a rather noble sacrifice to save them. I'll be anything but ordinary. In a show full of colorful characters with larger-than-life titles, Luce's moniker has remained the same since episode one. She consistently identifies as Luce the Human. For I am Luce the Human. This is in direct opposition to her stated goal. She wants to be a witch. But she doesn't really know what that means, and the show actually calls her out on this because the Owl House is always asking its audience to recontextualize the meaning of labels. I stayed here because I wanted to learn magic, right? I wanted to be a witch like Ida and Azura! But what does that even mean? Did I expect to be a witch back in Connecticut? Being a witch means more than casting spells and wielding power. Ida was the most powerful witch on the Boiling Isles, but when she took loose under her wing, she unknowingly let light back into her life. Light she previously denied herself out of fear that her curse would hurt her loved ones. You'll run out of magic! It's my power, kid. And before you showed up, I spent my whole life wasting it. Life is just more meaningful when we make loving connections. This begs the question, what does it mean to be human? Philip Wittabane believes it entails an inherent sense of superiority, which makes him the perfect foil and antagonist for Luce. Philip is the worst of what humanity has to offer, and Luce is the contrasting light to his never-ending well of darkness. Philip is a textbook narcissist. Luce doesn't have an egotistical bone in her body. Luce wants to be a witch. Philip wants to kill them all. Luce builds people up out of love. Philip builds them up to exploit them. The confidence, the compliments. He says everything you want to hear. Philip is such a perfect foil to Luce that it actually made me question why the Owl House bothered introducing the Collector as the show's ultimate antagonist, especially since Disney unfairly shortened season three. And then it hit me. Neha, I love your creativity, but it's gotten out of hand. The Collector is yet another foil to Luce. He's a chaotic neutral who doesn't care about the resulting carnage, not unlike how Luce's creativity was a destructive force pre-Boiling Isles. Luce's character arc is all about balance, fantasy and reality, human and witch. Her identity lies somewhere between these extremes. No one is fully one thing. We are multifaceted and complex beings. Simple titles can never encapsulate our complete personhood. If we want to self-actualize, we have to make definitive choices and learn how to confront our preconceived notions about the world around us. Hey, wouldn't you rather, uh, I don't know, have a beach day? Maybe if we had time for 20 more adventures, but we don't. In an ideal world, the Owl House would have a full third season to explore remaining loose threads and themes. I can only imagine how frustrating it is as a creator to not have control over the situation. But instead of complaining about the unfairness of it all, the show's crew chose to give us the best they had to offer within the constraints they were given, and that's incredibly inspirational. I am reminded of a Stanley Kubrick quote. Children, of course, begin life with an untarnished sense of wonder. A capacity to experience total joy at something as simple as the greenness of a leaf. But as they grow older, the awareness of death and decay begins to impinge on their consciousness and subtly erode their joie de vivre, their idealism, and their assumption of immortality. As a child matures, he sees death and pain everywhere about him and begins to lose faith in the ultimate goodness of man. But if he's reasonably strong and lucky, he can emerge from this twilight of the soul into a rebirth of life's elan. He can forge a fresh sense of purpose and affirmation. He may not recapture the same pure sense of wonder he was born with, but he can shape something far more enduring and sustaining. However vast the darkness, we must supply our own light. <laughs>